Um, all right, I'm looking at my phone right now just because I've got a bunch of data for you if you want it. Um, Give it to me. Uh, all right, so year over year, since we relaunched the site on June 15th, uh, our page views are up 2,002.03%. Our users are up 2,760.15%. Uh, and I can slow this down if it's too fast. Uh, our revenue is up 11,000% and our VIP subscribers are up 149,500%. Um, yeah, send, send that to me. Um, uh, I mean, I was going to ask you. I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it in an email. Um, for you uh, right will you do like hard numbers or is it, you'll only give me the percents and stuff? Yeah, we're only going to give the percents, but they're big. Okay. Um, I mean, you can't be up that much without big numbers. So um, they're uh, they're big, <laughs> is uh, is what we'll say. I mean, I, I mean, I can say pretty straightforward. I think um, in at some time in 2021, we will be a hundred million dollar plus business uh, pretty easily. That is uh, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, but I mean, you can also look around at the marketplace in general. I mean, if the ringer's getting $200 million for basically a podcast network, uh, if Barstool's getting whatever it was, $400 million plus dollars, uh, we're very comfortable that we'll be a $100 million plus company in, uh, in 2021. Yeah, you're stealing um, some answers to questions I'm going to ask you. I figured it probably, so I was just going to give you that right off the right off the top because I asked our CEO to put those numbers together because I was like, can we get some some? Um, yeah, I, I so I guess before sort of like as we start, so you, I don't I, like it's totally your prerogative to record it. I'm just like, are you planning to then release it or what? I just I, I have found that I like to do live media, right? So if I'm going to talk for 20 or 30 minutes, uh, I would rather do it live so that everybody can hear it entirely in context. Sure. And I hope you're going to write a great article. <laughs> you know, I hope people read it. And never like, know. Oh, this is incredible. But if uh, if I'm spending the time to respond to a lot of questions, like I get questions all the time, and I don't always sit down and have the time to respond to them. So I feel like my audience enjoys seeing my responses to questions. Like we do a, uh, for the VIPs and OutKick, we do a weekly uh, Zoom session, which is where I'm talking to you right now, yeah. where basically anybody who's an OutKick VIP can ask me any question under the sun and I'll do my best to, uh, to answer it. And people love to just see it, you know, kind of the unvarnished answers live on the radio uh, or live on the Zoom or whatever it is. So. Uh, you know, if I'm going to spend the time answering questions, uh, and then, then I'm fine, like putting those questions and my answers out into the public in the same way. Like, oh yeah, no, I don't, I, it's totally your prerogative. Like I, I mean, if I'm recording the interviews with you, like I, I'm not like, it'd be, I can't say, oh no, you can't record it too. I was just, yeah, like, yeah. What? I just, I mean, like a lot of people like have PR handlers, right? Like I could have a PR handler who sits in for interviews, which I'm right. sure. So it's like, don't quote me out of context and I have the receipts to prove it. And then also potentially I want to share it with my audience. hundred percent. Right. Got it. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, if I do. That's yeah. why I like, yeah, if I, I, do, that's like, why I like, like honestly, guy that's why I like live radio and live TV because typically everything that's said is in the context of which it's said, as opposed to, you know, one sentence being pulled out, um, you know, and, uh, and look at what happened to Bill. Bill well, yeah, I mean, I have a, uh, I have a word count. So, I mean, I'm sure that there will be, I will have to take. No, no, no doubt. But like, but I don't have, imagine, yeah, I mean, I don't, it would. But imagine, look what just you, happened you to Bill Simmons. I, I York Times. Like, if you plan to do something with it, or if you might do something with it. Oh, or, I have no, I have no plans necessar necessarily to do anything with it. Um, I might, you know, like depending. Uh, and just put up like a question and answer session um, on for our VIPs. Like, you know, I may just, you know, put this behind the paywall and say, hey, you can you can watch this uh, if you're interested. Or if I think there are questions that you asked and I'm like, hey, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
I, I might use my answer that I gave to you as uh, as per for purposes of outcome. Or if you think I quoted you and you thought yeah. Or if I give that, or if I give an incredible you know long interview answer to a question and one sentence gets pulled out and everybody's like oh my god Clay Travis said X and I'm like well actually when you look at the context of it it's uh it's it's not exactly as it was portrayed. Um, anyway, um, I just get, I get a lot of media requests now. So most of them I just say no to, but I grew up, uh, reading the Washington post. I, I really deeply respect the newspaper. Um, uh, I think I might've told you this before, but I went to GW. Um, and so one of the best things about going to GW was reading the Washington post every day. And that was before the days of PTI. But I think the Washington post sports section getting to read Wilbon and Kornheiser every day. Yeah. I was like, my God, the, you know, as a kid growing up in Nashville, we had a local newspaper, but we didn't have guys who were talented like the guys who write in the Washington Post were on the same caliber. And so I loved, I mean, I was a subscriber in the Washington Post um, and uh, loved reading it, you know, for the four years that, uh, that I spent in DC. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I don't, I don't have any issue with that. Um, Okay, cool. Then fire away. Yeah, yeah, fire away. Um, okay, so May, I think you announced several new hires and Whitlock joins as a, as a partner in June. It's a fairly brutal moment for digital media, sports media. Also, uh, why do you think this can work? Why, why do it now? And I guess what's the headcount right now at Outkick? Also, we've got, I mean, I, I think you can look at the writer tab. So I don't want to, I don't want to miss, uh, miss a tribute um, and leave somebody out. But I believe we have got seven people writing on a daily basis at Outkick. Um, they, I mean, is it seven full timers or is yeah. it a mix? No, there are the seven who are on the site all work for us full time. And in fact, let me pull up the website right now just to make sure that I'm not miscounting that because we have a bunch of different people behind the scenes who do work as well. Obviously, uh, the writers are a substantial portion. So you have me, you have Whitlock, uh, you have uh, Dr. Chow, you have Bobby Barak, Ryan Glasspiegel, Joe Kinsey, Gary Sheffield Jr. Um, I believe that that seven is, uh, and we're adding a couple of more here in the near future, but those seven right now are people who are writing daily on the site. Now are those are those daily on staff? Does that mean like these are jobs with benefits and everything? Uh, I don't want to get into exactly how we're how we're struggling. These are full time yeah. people who work with uh, with Outkick. I mean, you know, Doctor Chow is obviously a doctor, so he's not um, he's not full time. Uh, yeah. But you know, their writing is only appearing with us, and uh, and so they're with us all the time. Okay, so why, um, I, I guess why, right, you've had the site for a while, why is it, why do, what, like, why, why do you think it can work sort of in this environment that is, you know, pretty brutal for, you know, so many digital media companies? Well, so I was making over seven figures a year off of Outkick for years and years now. Um, you know, just basically running it as a one-man band type shop. And uh, I, I know and uh, so far have been proven correct uh, in expanding that in, at some point OutKick needed to be something larger than me uh, in order to truly become a substantial media brand. And I think we're developing and doing that now. Um, the timing was right for a large part. Sports gambling is going to be a big part of what we do. I mean, I'm on a daily sports gambling show, Fox Bet Live. Uh, we obviously have been talking about sports gambling on the website and on the radio for years and years and years. And uh, the inflection point was right. And also the talent was out there to get. I've talked to some of these guys before in years past um, about coming to work for me. And I think you would acknowledge, and I think most people in our business would acknowledge, talent's rare. And I read a lot and I consume a lot of content and everybody that I brought in were people who I was reading already. And so the number one uh, standard for me uh, in terms of people we were going to hire was I already know they're good at what they're doing and I'm not going to have to spend a lot of time trying to develop talent, at least not right now. I want people who are able to hit the ground running full speed. 
and everybody we've brought in is uh, is able to do that. Um, I guess you read some of these before, but what um, I guess they, they sort of talk about sports, but I feel like you're more like at least lately, like since the relaunch, it's been more politics that, that the site has been known for? Uh, I don't think that that's true. I mean, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now. Well, in fact, I mean, I'll just look at the articles that are up on the site. Uh, all right. So we've got the anonymous mailbag, which I've been doing for a long time. Uh, story about the Cubs and something that happened with them. Uh, another Cubs story. Uh, David, Ch three reasons why the NFL will play in 2020 from Dr. Chow. Uh, James Connor says choice to play was easy. Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, Pennsylvania lawmaker makes poignant argument for high school football. Uh, Chicago Tribune sports writer, which is an interesting story, asks how many reporters were furloughed for an ad at Wrigley. Um, anyway, we got funny stuff there. Then we got Charles Barkley, Shaq, Karen, Kobe. I mean, I don't really mm -hmm. see anything that is immediately political there um, mm -hmm. as I'm scrolling through looking at our uh, looking at our storyline. So not to NBA futures odds now that the NBA playoffs are set. Um, you know, we are going to touch. We're an opinion site, right? We are primarily a sports opinion site, uh, but sports and the return of sports has obviously at times become supremely political uh, during this period. So. I define us as a sports opinion site with a broad mandate where we can have strong opinions about Game of Thrones, <laughs> which I wrote about and was one of the most popular things I wrote about for years, or on what might happen in the presidential debates, which I imagine we will cover as if they are a, uh, a sporting event. And an election in many ways does kind of feel uh, like a sporting event as well. But I think if you look at the, uh, at the political, if you want to classify them as that, stories that we're covering most of the time it's like hey the uh, uh the governor of texas like this week we had ron desantis the governor of florida on uh and my questions for him were about whether he supports college football being played at the university of miami florida state and florida uh we had the governor of texas on and my questions for him were about whether he supports college football being played at all the big 12 schools and all the sec schools um, and we had the president of the United States, and a lot of my questions were about the NBA, the NFL, uh, Major League Baseball, uh, and, and all of those things. Now, they touch on other subjects as well, but all of the focal points of those, I would say, were sports-related, uh, certainly first and foremost. Got it. What is, um, I guess, what's the, you see like a, the, the niche or sort of the audience that, that this site could reach sort of beyond you or is it you know when you expand the site is there a new audience or target audience or is it's the same you're just sort of delivering more content i i hope it's going to be a lot bigger i mean right we're paying people uh substantial sums of money not to reinforce the audience that i already have i mean i think that's where jason whitlock's edition has been seismic um i think you can look at all the different guys that we have brought in uh you know we're projecting and projections can go out the window at any moment who knows what might happen but we think we're going to be close to 10 million readers in uh in the uh in this month in august and if we don't hit 10 million in august we'll hit it in september so we got a really big audience and uh it's growing pretty substantially um and uh and and i think you know the the, the ceiling is what 20 million 30 million I, I don't even know what our ceiling is but i know it's not 10 it's going to be a lot higher than that and that'll make us one of the biggest sports focused sites uh, on the entirety of the internet. And that's just the website. You know, that's we're launching a new podcast network. Jason Whitlock, who I think is the best sports columnist in America, is going to have what I think is going to be one of the best sports podcasts in America. Uh, we're adding in a lot of other people there. Um, you know, our, our, our growth in video is off the charts. I gave you some numbers earlier. Um, but, uh, but let me see here. I think I just got, we're going to do over 10 million video views, um, easily in the month of August and may, may do 15. Um, that's up massively, uh, across platform, whether it's Twitter, whether it's YouTube, um, uh, whatnot. So, uh, we are, uh, really kind of starting to hit on all cylinders, but I also have been saying, 
were a little bit like somebody who is uh, driving in a car and trying to change the tire while you're driving a car. Uh, the business is growing so rapidly that I sometimes feel like I'm leaning out the window trying to get a hubcap on a car. Um, you know, so, uh, so there's a lot of things to take care of and a lot of details to get ironed out. Uh, but I think by the time, you know, we really get rolling in football season, the outkick is going to be paced to officially hit their stride. And you asked me about launch, uh, you know, bringing on people in a time of economic strife is obviously uh, somewhat of a challenge. But I'm not looking, you know, at the next six months. Uh, I, I, I could, when we launched, have not made a dollar for three years and still been in a really good space based on what I've been able to do with OutKick and the money that I've been able to put away before. We're already in July, super profitable. So that's not even a concern. Uh, you know, lots of media companies are not remotely profitable. We're already rolling in profits uh, in July uh, with, you know, just Jason Whitlock and everybody on. That's the first full month we've had. August is gonna be profitable. So uh, I'm not worried about that, but when we launched, I was not thinking about a horizon of six months. I was thinking about a horizon of three to five years and the growth that we would have during that period of time. Um, from a business side, I guess I'm curious how you think about it, right? Is it, is it subscribers? Is it podcast ad revenue? Is it Periscope? It's all revenue, I guess. Is it? <laughs> it's I want. We're gonna. We need to make money in everything that we do, right? I mean, I'm not in the business of trying to uh, to do something and it not make economic sense, you know, as a business person. So uh, I expect that our podcast business will be wildly profitable. I expect that our website will be wildly profitable. I expect that our radio show will be wildly profitable. I expect that everything that we're doing, gambling related businesses. Uh, and, uh, and certainly everything that we're doing is about creating economic value and profit. So um, there are multiple buckets if you want to kind of classify it that way. There's the website advertiser bucket. Uh, there is the, uh, there's the VIP bucket. Um, there is the gambling bucket. There's the podcast network bucket. Um, all of those will be multi-million dollar businesses, not to mention that we sell apparel and everything else, uh, but all of them will be part of the OutKick Media uh, company in general, but all of them will be profitable. It's not like we're doing anything that is going to lose money. And the one thing I will say about my business acumen, if you want to put acumen in quotation marks, I'm good at talking about business with business people but I'm also pretty good at being able to talk to writers and people who are in creative space. So I'm not a sophisticated businessman, right? Like compared to CEOs and people who go to Harvard Business School. Um, I mean, you're talking to a guy who lost $50,000 in the pants business several years ago, right? Uh, so, uh, so, but I am able to have intelligent conversations with business people and also simultaneously be pretty good at talking with creative people. So I feel like I'm a conduit um, where I can go to the writers and say, hey guys, this, this is why this makes sense from a business perspective. Let's look at the data, let's do more of this. And then I can also go to the business people and say, hey, let's try to put out a projection of what we think we can do in 2021 from the podcast business. Here's what I think our audience is gonna be uh, across the board. So, I, so what I think I do well is kind of straddle that creative and business environment where I can talk to both, but not be a super sophisticated business person. I, I am, I think, able to be super sophisticated and creative on the creative side, but maybe I've got a little bit more business chops than most people certainly in our industry do. Um, and then you can, I know, I think the Daily Beast got into this a little bit, but you can't share uh, the, the number of subscribers or VIPs. Well, my hope when we started the OutKick VIP business was that we were going to have 10,000 subscribers one day. That was like a wildly optimistic number that I had in my head uh, because we charged $99 for the year, $12.99. We now have a monthly subscription uh, project. Yeah. We're going to be well over 10,000. So uh, we, we are rolling. In All that well over or will be? We, we just, we are going to, it's, it's a multi, the VIP alone you can do the math, is a multi-million dollar business. 
So we are killing it there. And we have exceeded when I initially thought, hey, I'd like to do a VIP business associated with Outkick. My initial sort of wild dream subscriber number was, hey, if we could get to 10,000, because we'd be doing a million dollars a year in revenue just off the Outkick VIP. We're there. Like, right, we are absolutely, like, now the question is, I mean, our you're CEO. Over, you're over 10,000. Yeah, our CEO said, hey, our new goal is 100,000. I think that's a wildly ridiculous goal, uh, right. but we've gone from hoping to get to 10,000 to now he hopes to get to 100,000. I you're, think it's a crazy over, You're over 10,000. I think that's a crazy goal of 100,000, but 10,000 is not the goal anymore. Right, because you've reached it, because you're over 10,000. I'm not going to get it. I don't, I don't want to be in the, in the business of like constantly updating our numbers. It's a multi, VIP is a multi-million dollar business. Okay. Um, when you, I guess, it, um, when you look at, um, you sort of mentioned this, the bar stool and the ringer, right? Anyone sort of launching a digital media business these days is, is, immediately or, or at some point thinking about getting sold usually. Uh, is that, uh, you mentioned it, right? You mentioned if Barcel can be valued at X and the ringer can be bought at X. Is that what you're thinking about? No, not really. I mean, I would, in an ideal world, I would continue to run Outkick for the rest of my life and we would turn it into a fabulous business and we would never need to go and bring in anybody else. I, I don't know what the future. Well, I think you mentioned you right. You mentioned sort of barstool and the ringer being valued at X. So I guess. But I think that's I think that's just a reflection of where I think it's reasonable to think that the Outkick business can go. Those right? are the cons. The you think about you think about yeah, those the, the difference that I would say with those guys is we've never taken any venture capital money, right? So barstool got on the track, and I think the ringer took at least some early on. I think I'm not an expert in their business structures. But we haven't brought in any venture capital partners. Like the the so while yes, we have now expanded and hired a lot more people um, and really kind of made a real effort to add steam onto the site. Remember, the site's nine years old. And you know, I literally sold every single ad and did every single aspect of this business to build it up into, you know, where I was making seven figures a year on a very lean business model, right? But I knew that just based on the audience that I was able to deliver, uh, that, that the business model was there uh, to work. But I, I had, have had inquiries, as I'm sure you can imagine, for years and years about people who have said, hey, I want to come in. Uh, are you interested in raising venture capital money? All those things, and we've never done it. So I can't say what the future is going to hold, uh, but the reason why I started OutKick nine years ago was to have complete creative freedom. That matters to me immensely to be able to write and say exactly what I think every single day. Um, and, uh, and so it seems to me that very often when you decide to take money, you are giving up freedom in exchange for that money when it comes to venture capital. So again, I don't so know what the, the future like, I guess the, the, I mean, if you've been to my house, if somebody showed up at my house and offered me a million dollars more than what I think my house is worth, I would sell it. Like I'm a capitalist, but I don't have any desire to sell the company and we are profitable. Like I said, extremely profitable. So there's no necessity of, Hey, we're running this at break even trying to get big and hoping that somebody's going to come bail us out. No, I mean, we're going to have a $100 million business, I right. firmly believe, next you, year without like me. The, um, but like the influx, right? Like, as I understand it, like Whitlock is bought in, you know, as an equity partner. Is that where sort of the cash infusion comes to make the hires? Or? No, we don't. We're, again, we're, we, are, uh, we are extremely profitable. So, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't have to worry right now about raising money. So, um, so you're just again, hiring sort of like off outkick profits. Or what's that? You're just you're making hires off of outkick. Correct. Profits. I've always done that. You know, outkick has been profitable since I launched it. We've always shown a profit, right? Like, so I understand. Like, there are a lot of people out there 
in the media business that are like, oh, we're just going to go get big really fast. We're going to go hire a ton of people. And they almost never make money. And I don't know if like, I didn't go to business school, like I said, I mean, I went to law school instead, but I don't know of any law firm that would be run where people be like, hey, we're going to go hire a ton of people. And we're going to hope that we're able to, at the end of the year, pay all those people. Like we are growing at a totally reasonable rate. Like at the end of every month, I sit down with the CEO and I'm like, hey, what's our profit margin? How are we looking for the next month, the month after that? Uh, because I don't ever want to be in a position uh, where we're suddenly having to cut back. And so we're, we're profitable and I hope we're always going to be profitable. I don't ever want to be the guy who's like, hey, we're going to take a big swing here and we might lose $20 million this year or something like that. God forbid. No, <laughs> I I don't ever want to run a media business that loses money. Right. Do you, um, I guess, what is the, do you think that there's like a, a sort of the audience here? I think, I think Whitlock to front off of sports described it as like, we're going to treat sports as like, you know, this masculine endeavor that other places don't. Is there, right. What is the sort of ethos of the site or sort of what is the, audience for well so different than other sports sites is it you know going for you know the same audience what is you know sort of i I, I think yeah i think we are serving the 75 or 80 percent of sports fans who feel like sports has become far too serious uh and political uh and i think there are in in the sports media industry i think there's a knife fight for the 20% of sports fans that I would say are woke or are left wing. I think that people are cutting each other left and right, battling to be the media company that serves that left wing component. I hope they read OutKick. I hope 100% of all sports fans, and frankly, I wish 100% of everyone in the world of American uh, you know, internet life visited our website. Uh, but to me, what I am uh, sort of driving the force behind OutKick is to be smart, to be fearless, and to, uh, and to appeal to a large audience that doesn't feel like they're being served by the marketplace. And by the way, that's nothing new. When I launched OutKick yeah. in 2011, yeah, talked about that before. yeah, look, I mean, my initial launch of OutKick back in 2011, I was like, hey, you know, I love SEC football. That was our launch, right? That was always our foundation was I love college football. And I felt like college football was undercovered on the internet compared to the Yankees Red Sox or compared to, uh, you know, the Redskins against or the Washington football team, I should say, uh, against the Dallas Cowboys. You know, there were certain teams that were wildly over indexed. And I looked around as a kid who grew up in Nashville and I said, man, you know, I love SEC football. There's really not that much good stuff to write to read on the Internet about SEC football. So that was my initial foundation was just serving the audience of people that I knew uh, were there who were died in the wool college football fans. And so um, I don't think what we do is crazy. Right. I, I think you uh, produce content that you or yourself would want to read. And that's why the people that I've hired are all people that I would want to read. And then you keep producing more of that content and you find more people who are good at producing that content. And that's how you grow. But that's been sort of the site ethos since 2011. And if you talk to my wife, when I started OutKick, I thought it was going to be super easy to find younger versions of me. I'm 41 now. I thought there was going to be tons of talent out there. Uh, And we even had a bullpen uh, portion of OutKick. We had an editor reviewing all the submissions. And what I found was talent's rare. There's lots of people who can write one good article, but then they're like, they just want to sit back and rest on their laurels. I'm like, man, you got to be able to produce day after day, month after month, year after year. And most people don't want to put the time or the effort or the energy into doing that. Um, and, uh, and so I'm glad I've got people who want to do that now that are working at OutKick. So when we think about audience, it, it's sort of, I mean, there's a, it's sort of, uh, I mean, the number of like prominent Republican politicians that have come on the show, 
recently is, you know, uh, you've got like future presidential candidates, you've got governors, I mean, you've got Murtaugh and Giuliani and, and Pat Toomey and Rubio, Josh Hawley, DeSantis, Greg Abbott, and, and uh, President Trump, which we'll get to. But I mean, it's a, it's a fairly huge list just in recent weeks. And I guess what's the, you know, I, you sort of mentioned that, you know, other sports media has gotten too political. What's the appeal for you to have them? And then, uh, you know, what's the, I guess, what's the level of interest? Are like people reaching out to you um, to come on the show at this point? The show is, the, the radio show is, I mean, it's, it's massive now. Um, I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, it's millions of people a month are listening to the radio show. Uh, you know, just background, we're on 300 uh, plus affiliate stations in all 50 states, you know, Sirius XM, Channel 83. Uh, we uh, have a massive podcast audience now. Um, all of that. So I, I think number one, uh, people have realized that the way to reach a large audience, we have one of the largest sports radio audiences in the country. Um, right, I guess that's like, heard that like a lot, you know, it's SEC country too and Nashville and sort of like, yeah, you know, we, we, we dominate uh, in the SEC. We dominate. Um, so, I mean, I mean, that's not me being cocky or anything else. The numbers reflect that the radio show dominates. And in particular, the radio show dominates, you know, from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern time in our particular time slot. Uh, you know, we had Tulsi Gabbard on. Uh, we offered every Democratic candidate who was running for president last year the opportunity to come on and talk about, uh, talk about their favorite sports teams, uh, the world of sports in general. We have offered Joe Biden the opportunity to come on since he's become uh, the, uh, the, the, the Democratic uh, presidential choice. We would uh, enter, offer Senator Harris. Like, I, to their credit, the people who have accepted our offers are, uh, are the, some of the people that you just named. Um, and so I, I'm willing to talk to uh, anybody. You know, I offered Mark Cuban yesterday to come on the show after he came after me on Twitter. But what I like to say on the show is, the First Amendment is alive and well on the show, and you don't have to agree with me on anything. But all of the people that you named have come on specifically to talk about sports-related issues. So, um, you know, you can name each of them, and I'll tell you the sports-related issue that they came on specifically to talk about. I'll do a few off the top of my head right now that I can recall. Uh, Senator Rubio came on because he was introducing legislation on name, image, and likeness. Uh, mm -hmm. in uh, the United States Senate uh, to deal with college players being paid. Uh, uh, Ron DeSantis came on this week in particular to say that he wanted the ACC and the SEC schools to play in his state. Uh, the governor of Texas came on this week to say that he wanted the Big 12 and the SEC states to play. Uh, Donald Trump came on specifically, the president did this week, uh, to say that he supports college football being played. Uh, Senator Toomey uh, came on specifically to talk about the importance of Little League Baseball. Uh, and the round tables that he had had there and the return of Major League Baseball and why it was important. Um, all of them, uh, I believe, across the board that have come on have come on specifically to talk about sports directly related uh, issues in their state or in their nation. Uh, and frankly, I think it's smart of them to, to decide to, to do that with, uh, with our audience. Yeah, I mean, there's a political element too, though, right? I mean, you know, Murtaugh came on and talked about COVID a bunch. Like, it's not just, right? And did Sorry, Mur Murtaugh? Yeah, he came on and, I, you know, I think that there was, you know, extensive extensive talk about the coronavirus. I mean, it's sort of like independent of any of these guests. Sorry, I'm, I'm not, the, the Murtaugh situation in particular, I don't really, um, I don't remember that one specifically. When did we do that one? Uh, April? Um... I might have to look that one up. I well, honestly, sure. but right, I guess I mean also right, like independent of any of those guests, there's like a ton of coronavirus conversation, which is sort of you know sports, but uh, you know I guess there's a sports element to it. But I think certainly a lot of times on your show, there's there's no sports component to it at all. I don't I don't think we had Murtaugh on the show. I think I would. I, I think I would remember if we had Ray him. Travis was joined by Tim Murtaugh, the director of communications for Donald Trump. Oh, sorry, sorry. Community. I thought you were talking about that. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the senator. Um, isn't there a senator Murtaugh now? Yeah, 
just on the Fox Sports website, re-election campaign to discuss the coronavirus situation in our country. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. but I thought you were talking about specifically politicians who were elected. I wasn't re remembering the uh, the Murtaugh reference in particular. Um, yeah, he came on the show to uh, to talk about bringing uh, sports back. And that was the, that look, to their credit, they specifically reached out and said, hey, can he come on and talk about bringing sports back in the country? And uh, and I said, yeah, we get requests pretty regularly. Yeah, I guess that's my question. Are you like in regular contact with the White House press office at this point? They reach out quite a bit, yeah. There's a lot, we have a lot of listeners in the White House. I mean, the White House reached out to put Donald Trump on uh, back in March or April of, uh, of this year and said the president likes the show. Um, whether that, I hope that's true. I hope he listens to the show all the time, just like I hope everybody listens to the show all the time, but he likes the show uh, and wanted to do it. Uh, would we be interested in having the president on the show? And I, of course, said 100% yes. I mean, I was thrilled. I would have, you know, Joe Biden, if Joe Biden wins election, or if Barack Obama was president and we'd been doing the show and they had reached out and said, hey, can the president come on? The answer is always gonna be 100% yes. But I guess like why, can you explain why it's only Republicans that seem to say yes? I mean, with one, uh, you know, outside of Tulsi? Well, no, I can't. I mean, I, I think that I think they're doing a disservice to their, uh, to their uh, attempts to serve their constituency. Uh, by not coming on the show, but I, I can't shoot. I mean, we have lots of coaches who won't come on the show too. <laughs> you know, lots of players won't come on the show too. Uh, I don't, you know, it's funny. Um, there will be like, uh, like John, I'll give you an example. John Calipari always wants to do Fox Sports Radio. Kentucky people, they always reach out and say, hey, uh, you know, John Calipari's got something he wants to promote. Can he do Fox Sports Radio? And I always say yes. And they initially agree, and then they come back and they say, actually, John Calipari doesn't want to do your show because he's mad about things that, that I have said about him in the past. Um, and that's sports-related, right? Directly sports-related. Um, but we don't talk. It's not like we sit around and talk a great deal uh, on the radio program about, you know, the intricacies of the, uh, of the Democratic uh, race, right? Like when we were deciding who was going to be the nominee or something like that. So, uh, but there, it, it regularly happens that people will choose not to do the show. So I, I can't presume to tell you why uh, Joe Biden uh, would not come on the show. Maybe he will. I mean, if he's smart, he would. <laughs> Uh, but the offer is out there, so uh, he has the ability to come on uh, just like the president does. Right. Um, I guess you wrote a book that was pretty critical of, of liberals for bringing politics into sports or sort of making uh, sports. I would, I would say. Is this different than what you've accused, I mean, you know, ESPN and, you know, I guess mainly ESPN of doing for years and years? I don't see it as being anywhere near the same to be in favor of college football being played. Like, I don't see that as being political. I guess some people could. To me, I want every college football team to play. Uh, to me, I, I'm not specifically saying anything about politics when I'm in favor of college football existing. So everybody that you're talking about this yeah. week that we've had on. Well, I guess, right, like there's college football, but there's also like a lot of the coronavirus stuff. You've been pretty outspoken on Ron DeSantis doing a better job than Andrew Cuomo. Like this is all stuff yeah. on, you know, where it's like very, you know, explicitly political, which I, do, I don't. You've been pretty critical. Of I think it's I think it's political that people have said Andrew Cuomo did a good job. I don't think it's political to look at the death rate in New York and New Jersey which is twice what the death rate is of any other place in the, in the world, really. I mean, if you look at any other country, New York and New Jersey have twice the death rate of Belgium, which I believe is the biggest country in the world, leaving aside a few you know, principalities and tiny you know, countries that may only have a couple hundred thousand people in them. Uh, Belgium is the largest country in the world the last time I checked. And again, I'm not expressing that this is 100 billion percent still true. But the last time I checked in 10 days or so, the numbers in New Jersey and New York were twice as bad as the numbers in, uh, in Belgium. And the numbers in New Jersey and New York are orders of magnitude greater on a per capita basis 
than what happened in Florida and what has happened in California and what has happened in, let's say, Arizona. And in fact, if you go look at the economies in those states, the economies in those states, in addition to the fact that they have an infinitely lower death rate, are also thriving in comparison to what we've seen in New York and New Jersey. So I don't see, I see that as looking at data and using data to make an argument. And really the fact I saw the numbers that, uh, the, the positive numbers that the media basically, I think, created for Andrew Cuomo. Uh, I think Andrew Cuomo has done a bad job relative to Ron DeSantis or Greg Abbott uh, in, uh, in both Florida and Texas. I think the data makes that abundantly clear. I, I don't see that as being political. I see it as like basically the equivalent of, of looking, at, uh, looking at results and judging them. Um, okay. Well, I guess, I mean, right, I think like ESPN, like when you sort of like talk about politics in ESPN, a lot of it was sort of like human rights is what they would say. And right, like how is that any more or less the, the, political? The, look, I don't, I have, if you read the book, what yeah. I have said is if ESPN is willing to, if they're going to go hyper-political, then I think they have an obligation to try to have an actual debate, right? Is there a single person on the record employed at ESPN right now who has said, I think kneeling is bad for the NBA's business. I think it's bad for the NFL's business. I don't think there's a single, I could be wrong. You can go search the last year's worth of, uh, of tape from ESPN. I don't think ESPN has a single person who has said that. I 100% believe that it's bad for business. I think they definitely have people that have said, you know, they don't agree with Neil. That they don't agree with Neil? I don't think they have a single person in a position of prominence that is on air right now that has said, uh, I disagree with Neiling, with the exception, and I got to give her credit for this, for Sage Steele. Sage Steele came out, to her credit, to the Wall Street Journal and said a lot of the things that I have said. I don't have a problem with politics in sports. I have a problem when major media organizations only allow one side of politics to be told and to be uh, shared. And Sage, Sage Steele, in her article in the Wall Street Journal, said, hey, I wanted to be on the ESPN special on social justice issues that they ran, uh, which, by the way, was the lowest rated television program in 25 years plus of primetime programming on ESPN. Uh, she said, I wanted to be on that show. And they basically told her that her opinion wasn't the right one to be on that show. Um, that's what I rip ESPN for. If they allowed people in positions of prominence to publicly disagree on air with, the, uh, with the, what seems to be, to me, a far left-wing perspective, uh, then I think it would be at least a balanced uh, and nuanced analysis of complex issues that, frankly, I don't think they're allowing. Our, our yeah, show, yeah, look, I think you love our, pretty, pretty, pretty. our show is a wide open forum. I take sh we take calls every single day, and I specifically request that callers call in and point out where I'm wrong or disagree with me. I poll the guys who work on my show, the producers, the behind the scenes crew. Uh, I, I, I'm not a guy who holds- website, I mean, do you have any articles on Outkick that talk about, you know, why it's important for, you know, NBA players to speak up for, you know, racial justice because, right, I, I mean, like, I, I, is it, are you publishing that kind of stuff on Outkick? We have all different sorts of opinions on the Outkick radio show every single day. And we have all different sorts of opinions every single day on the Outkick website, too. I mean, I told my guys, look, the First Amendment is alive and well. And so I don't have any clue how the people that I've hired are voting for president. I, I, we, we, may be, uh, we may be a Democratic majority uh, website. I, I, I legitimately don't know. I don't think that I've ever asked. Um, and I don't think that the... Uh, I don't think that the hires that I've made are, again, they're sports hires. So everybody's got opinions on a variety of different issues. And we write about and talk about a lot of different issues on, on OutKick every single day. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I hired Jason Whitlock is not because of who I think he's going to vote for president for. 
it's because I think he's the best national sports columnist in America. And the reason I hired our other guys is because the simple reason that I've been clicking on the links that they've written uh, for years. And I think I read a wide variety of different perspectives. I mean, this makes me sound like an old man, but I get the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal delivered to me every single day and read both cover to cover um, because I like to have two different perspectives on the world constantly in my head. So I'm aware of, uh, of where the sort of cultural battles, political battles, sports battles, what, what different perspectives are, are taking place. And maybe the lawyer in me, um, but you know, I'm constantly in my head uh, determining what my opinion is on a subject. And the way I do that is by having counter arguments that I make back and forth. I always say the good thing about what I get to do now compared to practicing law is when I practice law, um, you know, I had to take the side of whoever paid me, right? Like you are an advocate for the side that pays you. And sometimes you have the worst side. Now I get to look directly at every single argument and decide which of the arguments I think is the better. Um, and so I'm 100% sharing my honest opinions uh, every single day. How did the, um, I guess we sort of touched on this, but how did the Trump interview come about? You know, they reach out to you and say, we want to talk about this, or how did that, how did that come about? They reached out to me in March or April um, and said the president was uh, a fan of the show, uh, that they had mentioned the idea of doing it to him and that he was excited about the idea. Was I interested in having the president of the United States on my radio show? And my answer was immediately yes. Uh, and uh, I was ecstatic to have him on the show Tuesday. What, um, oh, actually, I actually meant to ask you about the Holly thing too, right? Like, and the, the Woj Holly thing, he, I think, right, I think I did two podcasts with you and did a, a Q&A interview or did, you know, some sort of interview with Whitlock, sort of like in the moments or days after um that story i mean like like outkick was sort of intertwined in 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 that story oh there's no doubt i mean and that's a situation that's a story uh and that's a perspective that i agree with senator holly on i think uh if you if you want me to go 100 percent political which you're which you're asking about um i believe broad scale that we are in a new modern day cold war with china and uh, I believe that China is trying to enforce their worldview uh, on the globe. And I think that is a bad thing to have an authoritarian Chinese communist yeah. government. No, I guess were you, did you know, did you know that he was, like, I think in his original tweet, right, he tagged Outkick. Was that- He tagged he, us in the response from- right, so uh, I mean, Like he knew, right, like he knew that that's a story that you guys would, would amplify. Or sort of like you know. Be, oh, I mean, well, I think he, I think he knew that because I've been writing and talking right. about the hypocrisy of the. Did he give you? Did you? Did you have a heads up about it, or were you surprised no. when you saw the tweet? No, I, I, I had no idea. Didn't know anything about it till he tagged us in the tweet. Um, you know, in our conversation, Senator Hawley also said that he grew up in Kansas City and thought Jason Whitlock was the best sports <laughs> columnist in America. I know. America. He tweeted that. What's that? He tweeted that. He tweeted that as well. Okay, so I mean, he said that on the on the interview, you know, and yeah. I agree with him. I think Jason Whitlock's the best sports columnist in in, in America. I really do. Yeah. Um, and so uh, and so, and by the way, the, the 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 other one that I think, to the extent that you want me to rate rate sports columnist in America, there aren't a lot of great ones now. Uh, Dan Wetzel at Yahoo Sports, I, I also think does uh, an incredible job. And I think Whitlock is right now with the, the role that he's on at Outkick, I think, I think he's the best sports columnist in America, but that's not a unique opinion. Like, right. uh, and also it's not an opinion. I had that opinion before I ever met Jason Whitlock. Like I would read his columns and say, man, this really is making me think. Um, and that's, you know, 15 years ago uh, when I was doing so. And uh, so, yeah, no, I didn't know that Senator Hawley was sending that letter to the NBA. Uh, certainly, I was like, wow, good for him. I mean, he's, uh, he's yeah. pointing out the hypocrisies that I've been raising uh, for months associated with the NBA's relationship with China. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when he tagged us in it and I saw the Woj response, that was the first time that, that I knew it. It's not like um, I knew anything about that going forward. And I think Senator Hawley, I mean, and I are somewhat similar, right? Like, uh, we're around the same age. 
uh, both law school graduates. Uh, I'm sure there are many things we disagree on in the world of politics, that, but one that we 100% agree on uh, is uh, regarding China and the NBA's relationship there. Yeah, I mean, you're pretty, you know, out front on the NBA and China. I guess I think that there are people who wonder both about, I guess I'd put you in the category, but also, you know, some Republicans have been very critical of the NBA, but perhaps not of President Trump for, you know, uh, friendship with the chair, uh, you know, uh, President I specifically yeah. asked. So, you know, and there was, right, I, and then he told Axios at one point, you know, about, you know, that he wasn't going to press them on, you know, concentration camps because, uh, you know, he's working on a trade deal. So I believe that Donald Trump has been the most difficult president on China of any in my lifetime. Uh, that doesn't mean that every single thing he said on China I've agreed with, yeah. because I think unless you're the president of the United States, you're not going to 100% agree with anything that any president says. But I uh, specifically on Tuesday asked the president about Hong Kong, uh, specifically asked him about China, and even yeah. specifically asked him about his relationship uh, with Chairman Z. Uh, and I thought that was actually maybe the most newsworthy thing that he said. Yeah, uh, he, didn't, he was, didn't mention sort of the human rights aspect of it at all. He talked about the virus, I think. Well, he said that he didn't have the same relationship with Chairman Z anymore, that they used to have a good relationship. Right, with, and he talked about it very specifically uh, in, in relation um, to the virus. Yeah, and look, I think that's where you look at his actions. I mean, he's been pretty aggressive in trying to, uh, and again, I'm not an expert in Hong Kong policy, so, uh, so uh, with China, uh, but based on my understanding of American policy with Hong Kong, we have taken pretty substantial actions against China, whether it's the consulate down in Houston, whether it is uh, trying to support uh, the basic human rights of, uh, of the protesters and letting it be known that we're not, as a country, uh, supporting the actions that the Chinese are taking in Hong Kong. Um, and so, uh, look, if, 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 if President Clay Travis was in charge of, uh, of everything uh, in the United States, uh, would I make different decisions uh, than Donald Trump? Probably. Would I make different decisions than Barack Obama? Probably. I mean, I think every single human who has any kind of political beliefs, the only person you're going to agree with 100% of the time is yourself. Sure. I guess <laughs> I, mean, I would say sort of, right, like when you think about sort of Republicans, I, you know, I have asked some people about the site, and I think that there, you know, are people who view it, you know, uh, you've said, We'll have anybody on but you know there's people who view it you know can this be the fox news of sports and i think somebody you know mentioned to me that it's you know become trump propaganda essentially um and i, I guess that's sort of what i'm asking about uh, i think that's funny i mean we're not propaganda for anybody uh look i am the outkick is and i 100 percent believe this to be true and i think this is why we are growing so fast we represent the first amendment wing of the first amendment right I don't think there is a single sports media company in the country that has as expansive of a range of opinions, smart opinions, on a day-to-day -day basis as we do on the internet. I 100 billion percent believe that, and certainly that's something that we're working to build going forward. Um, but, you know, look, the reason why I started OutKick was to have the ability to say exactly what I want to say every single day. Um, we, everybody has that, but the, it's literally the foundational reason of why I started OutKick. So, um, I, I think the idea that you, I mean, it, you should talk to people in positions of prominence in media and be like, Hey, uh, you know, do you think you can convince Clay Travis to put something up on his site under his name that he disagrees with? I think they all would say hell no. And I think they probably would say that about me more than almost anybody out there. If I agree with something, then I'm happy to amplify it um, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, continue to give uh, attention to people that have uh, ideas that I think are important that aren't getting discussed enough. Uh, but look, I mean, you've got however many people it is in the, in the media, in uh, the bubble, in the NBA, and James Harden wears a Blue Lives Matter mask and within 10 minutes of it going on social media, it seems like all the media can show up 
and ask him about it. Adam Silver says that he has mutual respect for China, and I don't think anybody's pushed him on that question ever in the entirety since in the month plus since he said that. Uh, so when Josh Hawley points out what we've been writing at OutKick and draws attention to it. I mean, I, 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 the ESPN's defense, I think they've had the biggest, you know, bombshell story about China. To their credit, yeah, and I, I gave them credit for that. No, the Fainu brothers are these incredible reporters. Went and broke this, you know. I, and I gave them, and I gave them credit for that. And I'm not sure that that article would have happened if Senator Hawley and Senator Blackburn's letters had not been published and gotten attention. Uh, I don't. I can't claim to know. Oh, what you can't be like working on a story like that, and then like all of a sudden there's a green light like two weeks, you know, because these letters. I, are, I, I can't. I can't claim to. Uh, I can't claim to uh, to know the background on the reporting, but I, you can go check my Twitter feed. I gave ESPN a lot of credit for writing that story. Um, I definitely think they were happy to have that story. Just put it this way: after Woj wrote "f you" to a sitting United States senator. Sure, but I don't, like, regardless, I don't think that had any bearing on, like, public. And like, I will really point out, working on it. I will point um, out, while they did write that story, we also did a story about the coverage of that story. It almost wasn't mentioned anywhere on ESPN, which is kind of the opposite of what they usually do when they break major stories. Usually they roll those guys out on every single platform they've got. They talk about their stories all day long, everywhere. Uh, to his credit, and again, I'm, you can go look up the story. Uh, to his credit, I think Dan Lebetard was the only on-air ESPN personality that even mentioned it. I think they you also did the morning uh, podcast with Pablo Torre. I know. Um, Look, it at length. The, the, the television network is how most people define what ESPN is. They, they definitely did not put the full rocket fuel boost behind that story by broadcasting it out widely on their television network. Uh, I give them credit for writing it, but if that had been a story about the New England Patriots and the dysfunction of the Patriot franchise, that would have been the only, the number one lead story they did all day long, every day. Let me, um, well, you've sort of been front and center on the coronavirus. As on your radio show, it's been like a pretty, um, you know, front and center topic, more so, sort of like the media coverage of it, you know, the, the, the fact that it's not a, as big a deal as, as others have made it. It's your show, not within a sports context, right? It's, you can't do sports without talking about the coronavirus, but I think it's pretty fair to say your show has talked about it differently. And, you know, there's the Tim Miller piece that sort of walked through, you know, a number of things that you said, um, whether it was in March or April, uh, you know, this is the flu, this is, we have nothing to worry about, a few hundred people are going to die. Do you have any, um, I guess, why have you felt the need to talk about it? Do you have any sort of, you know, regrets or, or changes of how you wish you had talked about it? At various I times? said, you know, months ago um, that the one thing I wish is that I hadn't trusted the numbers out of China and I hadn't trusted the numbers from the WHO. Uh, because we now know that those numbers were not accurate. So when I was writing about it back in March, the expectation was that the numbers um, that China had put out and that the WHO had put out, it seemed that everyone was treating them as legitimate. Um, and so those early takes back in March, uh, I wish that we had had accurate information from China at the time. Uh, and I've said that. And so what I always say to my audience is, I apologize when I get facts wrong. I'm not going to apologize for opinions. So those facts were wrong. And they made my opinions in March not as good as they would have been if they had been rooted in better factual analysis. So I regret that I trusted China and I trusted the WHO, uh, as I said, for, for months to my audience. I believe, and look, I've been straightforward about this. I think our response as a nation to the coronavirus is the worst decision in the 21st century since we went to war with Iraq. Um, and, uh, and I'm pretty straightforward about that. I think we never should have been in war with Iraq. I think that was the single worst decision that any president or political leader has made in the 21st century. 
And I think the way that we have responded to the coronavirus is, the, is worse than that. So it has now surpassed Iraq, in my mind, as the worst political failure of uh, the 21st century in America. What do you mean by failure? I mean that the way that we have responded, I think has, I mean, I've been talking about this for, for months. I mean, I don't think, look, back in March, when maybe we didn't have enough information. Well, I guess to you, does it, on something like this, where it's sort of life and death, does it give you pause to sort of weigh in with the kind of certainty that you did back then, you know, as this was such a new thing, as the, you know, I talked about the, what we believed were factually accurate statements, which I do all the time. No, no, I, but, but I guess shut like, down, sort of like, you shut know, down all of sports. Um, I talked about it in the, to my audience. Uh, and for two weeks, I think you could justify maybe a two week shutdown in the nation when we didn't know all of the data and we didn't know exactly what we were dealing with. Right. I, I guess you, that there are that, still like, any shutdowns at all is crazy. Right. And I think larger context, the big issue here is that we have allowed um, our national discourse to become binary in nature. And what I have been straightforward and consistent about since March is there are major consequences that are outside of the coronavirus. Uh, the number of suicides are skyrocketing. The number of drug overdoses are skyrocketing. Unemployment is a major health issue for people out there who are otherwise unable to take care of their families or themselves. I think we looked at the coronavirus as if it stood alone and there was no other factor at play. And I think our national policy was not what it should have been. I think it was oversimplified. I think it was not intelligent enough. And I think, unfortunately, the debate over the decisions to make seemed to me somewhat similar to the debate we had about whether to go to war in Iraq. And if you want to go back even further, um, you know, the, the response was mostly emotional as opposed to logical. I think the idea that there is, I think all kids should be in school, uh, including my kindergartner who was in school today, including my seventh grader who is in school in person today. Uh, all, all colleges should be open, like, and, and most people should be back at work if they're, uh, if they're, under the age of 50, and if they're not immune yeah. suppressed, yeah. we need to be back to normal. But well, when you talk about like that binary thing and sort of these emotional reactions, I think you were like pretty, you know, vehement that, you know, Mike, the governor of um, Ohio shouldn't be, you know, kicking fans out of the, you know, NCAA tournament, you know, back when I think, they I think, look, for the two weeks in March, when people were unsure about what was going on, uh, I think you could make an argument that a national shutdown may, and well, I, I'm not talking about the national shutdown, just sort of like in this sort of this binary, like emotional reactions without, you know, the data. I try, I try, and I think my audience knows that pretty consistently, um, I try to make sure my opinions are rooted in factual accuracies. And so um, to the extent that the China and WHO numbers weren't factually accurate, I think that led to um, a lot of bad decisions being made. Uh, around the world, frankly, um, in terms of how everybody responded to it, because China made it seem as if the worst case scenario uh, was not actually uh, as bad as the worst case scenario ended up being. Yeah, I did talk to um, I talked to one Fox employee who said they were told um, directly by an executive that there were some Fox Sports executives that were concerned about your coronavirus commentary. And then there was also the Rachel Benetta tweets a few months ago. Have you heard anything from like Fox Sports about the coronavirus commentary at all? To Fox's credit, um, during my time that I've been there, they have never told me, hey, you can't say anything. So, uh, you know, like, and, and I think for most people who work in, in, in media, I would hope that that's the case. Certainly, um, no, nobody ever calls me up and says, hey, you had a segment on your radio show. Never in five years of doing radio has anybody called me up and said, hey, you can't say that. You can't have this opinion. Uh, you're not allowed to say that. No, it's never, never happened. So uh, I don't know uh, where that would be coming from, but that's not true. Nobody at Fox has ever tried to tell me 
not to have an opinion on on anything. Got it. Um, did you? I guess I I should have asked you this before, but sort of on Whitlock. Like, did you like when you think about the expansion of the site? Would you have done it without Whitlock? Or well, we had already made we had already made some hires, right? Um, so before we brought in Whitlock, we had already uh, hired um, a couple of the guys away, Ryan Glasspiegel and Bobby Barack, who've done really good work for us. I'd already hired Joe Kenzie um, from Busted Coverage. Mm -hmm. All three of those guys, and Mike Schamberger, I think, who's been doing really good work for us as well. I think all four of those guys were already, I don't think, they all four were already hired. I didn't know Whitlock was going to become available. Fox made an offer to him. Um, yeah. Really, I mean, it would be a fascinating story. I mean, I think he's written and talked about this quite a bit. Uh, and now uh, you're seeing it start to happen more and more. But he felt like he would have more freedom to say exactly what he thought on OutKick uh, than he would on his television show. And also that he would be able to reach more people. Uh, and, you know, you could go ask him. But I think he said a lot publicly that he's ecstatic, and I am too, to see what reach he has had already as a columnist. Yeah. So we were already going to expand. Uh, but to me, uh, Whitlock, like I said earlier with you, talent is rare. And so to me, when I saw Whitlock's availability, I said, man, I've got to be there. I've got to figure out a way to get him uh, to come work for me once he had decided he wasn't going to be at Fox. He was exploring options. And uh, I think, you know, it's been a one plus one equals eight scenario. You know, we have not just, you know, gotten better. I think yeah. we've gotten exponentially better. What is, um, actually, I would like to ask Whitlock, what is the, what's the best contact for him? Uh, I'll email you his email address. Okay. I don't know that he'll want to talk to you <laughs> uh, because he's not a, he's not a fan of talking to media. He likes to talk directly to the audience himself. Um, but, uh, but I'll, I'll pass along his email address. He always says, I'll talk to anybody anytime. I think he means live. I'm sure he would put you on uh, his, uh, put you on his program. Um, but I mean, look, the, the reason why I'm recording this thing is I'm going to spend a lot of time talking with you. Um, but I love doing live radio or live TV. Um, and I do it every single day, but people can hear every word that I say for better or worse. Um, and so, uh, I, I think in media, you know, if you have the opportunity to have your entire story told or not, you'd prefer to have your entire story told. I can't speak exactly for him, but that's, right. I'll email him. And see what he says. Yeah, just send me his email address. The uh, what? The other thing that I, I wanted to ask you, I sort of talked about Fox. Like I sort of, you know, I called around a little and asked about, you know, OutKick and Fox because I think, you know, sort of Fox Sports and, you know, how the politics of the moment is, you know, pretty interesting. And heard sort of the way your website was affiliated with Fox there were a couple of things, you know, that led to sort of the splintering. And one was in 2016, um, the way you were writing about the sexual harassment allegations against Peyton Manning, they asked you to tone that down. Um, First of all, let me pause there. That's not true. Yeah. Uh, nobody, look, when I signed, uh, when I told you when I started OutKick that at no point in time, uh, was I ever going to give up any sort of creative control for what? No, that was my point. They talked to you and, and essentially your contract said you had complete editorial freedom. And so there was nothing that was, there was I, that's, that's, conversation because you're-, you're I don't even think that was, th th that was a necessary conversation uh, because I had and always have had um, complete editorial freedom. I mean, that, that was a big part of when we signed the licensing deal with Fox. Right. But it was ago. after that, that the, that the Fox sports website stopped hosting the blog, sort of stopped licensing the blog. I, I don't even, so when that ended, uh, our contract just expired. So, um, and I decided to go back on my own. Uh, so no, I, I there, whatever, whoever told you something about Peyton Manning and yeah. uh, the way I covered the allegations of sexual harassment against Peyton Manning, I, I'm not in, like, I don't have a, you know, perfect sure. recollection of every single issue uh, in my life, especially from things that happened four years ago. But I don't rec recollect ever having a single conversation uh, about the Peyton Manning sexual harassment. You would say that the licensing agreement expired and that's when you took your blog back, essentially. That's right. Okay. And then the other one was 
even after that, there was still, you know, some, you know, occasional republishing and promoting of OutKick. But at some point, you submitted a piece that questioned the LeBron James victim of a hate crime um, in the playoffs. And, you know, there was an editor that was like, we can't, you know, run this, be affiliated. This is Fox Sports. And then soon after that, the Fox Sports website sort of completely stopped promoting that's, that's the blog. That is one. First of all, I don't even remember the date on that. Yeah. Uh, I think that is a uh, hundred billion. First of all, that is a hundred billion percent not true. But I think OutKick might have been already independent of Fox when the LeBron James graffiti incident happened. I'd have to go look. It said that it was right. It was not. It was independent, but the blog that there was still. Um, I think there was still I, some I, sort of some sort of like promotional relationship, and then I don't. I don't think that that is. I'm not 100 percent sure because again, yeah. I'm not sure what exactly the date was. Uh, but if you tell me the date, if you go look it up right now, I think we were 100 percent independent. So there was. I think it was. A, I think I don't think that they would contradict with you being one hundred percent independent. I think that it was still like the website still promoted, right? Like there, there was. No, still no, no. What I'm what I'm saying is I don't even think there was an affiliation with the website when I. Oh yeah, I don't think that there had to be an affiliation. I think, but sometimes the website would you know publish stuff or promote stuff. Um, I mean, Fox Sports uh, again. Like this is getting into the weeds. But Fox Sports uh, always promoted Fox Sports related direct content to like their Facebook feeds or whatever else. Like, I, I have no idea who you talked to uh, on that, but like the, the Peyton Manning sexual harassment thing and the LeBron James graffiti thing, like yeah. zero, zero conversations at, with anybody at Fox and zero discussions about, hey, uh, you can't write this or you can't do this or in some way like literally zero. So, and, and again, I think for the LeBron James graffiti story, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that that was after our licensing deal had. No, it was definitely after the licensing, but as it was. So they never, so they never promoted anything from OutKick after the licensing deal would be over. I mean, that, that was the purpose like that when you don't have a relation, like we were a completely independent media company that wouldn't. There, there was somebody on the digital, but I guess like why, or at some point like that story like came across the Fox Sports digital desk. So I mean, even if there wasn't no, a licensing agreement. Stop, hold on. That's not true either. Like I never had an editor at Fox Sports. Yeah. So there's no like coming like that story. I'm just telling you is no, no. I don't think it like I don't think it was like, like it might have come across their desk because they clicked on my website while they were sitting at their desk, uh, yeah. and they saw it on my website. I'm sure that they read it like millions of other people uh, read stories that go up on Outkick, but they had there was zero zero connection to anybody. And look. The larger story that, that, you know, is behind what you're saying there is um, Fox basically stopped producing all digital content, right? So you're talking about a couple of my stories, but FoxSports.com came in and let go. Right. This, this would have been before that, right? Like this. Would no, no, no. Before no, that. Like this, this was, this was, no. When, when they basically got out of the editorial business. Um, yeah, completely, this, this would have been before that. Yeah, no, these are the like the, the what I'm saying is Fox was out of the editorial business before they were out of the outkick business. Does that make sense? Like they stopped running all articles on their site and pivoted entirely to video before our deal was was complete. Right. So um, so they they had not just like you're saying like oh they're not sharing stuff from out video was... what i am saying is they weren't sharing any written content at all and they've only just recently started to circle back yeah. after several years um to even produce any kind of original written content at all okay. so um, <laughs> I, I think the bigger story by yeah. far there is them getting out of the business like sure. it didn't did none it of this i'm telling you, none of this was uh, was impacted um, at all. I do remember if you want a story, like somebody once sent uh, uh, and said, who doesn't work at Fox Sports Digital anymore, 
Um, I had put up a picture of, uh, I was at the SEC title game, um, and uh, there was like, they were doing like breast cancer awareness or whatever, and they made some tits out for the Tide uh, uh, lapel pins. And I posed in a picture uh, with some girls on social and, uh, and uh, they had the tits out for the Tide uh, logo. And somebody emailed me and was like, hey, will you take down that tweet? And I said, no, <laughs> it's a breast cancer awareness thing. That's literally, so you know, the only time that I can remember ever uh, having a conversation with anybody at digital about any content that, uh, that I put out um, on social or anything like that. Got it. All right. Um, all right. And I did right back then, uh, by the way, which might be the story that you were hearing. I wrote back then and said, hey, go check my contract. I've got creative control. I'm not going to delete the tweet because you're upset about a breast cancer right. awareness. Oh, and I get the other one, right? Like you have, like Fox did, they did ask you, right, like to do a show at one point, but not to talk politics on anything. And you were like, no, I'm going to talk politics. No, no, that was not, that's a little bit. So Jamie Horowitz, who I like, um, came to Fox and he set me down and said, uh, if you will stop talking about Game of Thrones, if you will stop talking about, uh, you know, any kind of pop culture or politics or anything else and just focus on sports. All I want from you is sports takes. Right. You can have your own show. Um, and, uh, and I said, you know, yeah. I thought about that a little bit and I was like, no, uh, I right. don't want it. Yeah, the way, I mean, the way I, you like cordially declined, like it wasn't acrimonious at all. No, I, look, I have what I would consider to be really good relationships with, uh, with the people that I work with at Fox. Um, you know, all of the, all of the people who have been my bosses over the years. And obviously to make it clear, there is no connection whatsoever right now between the Outkick website and anybody at Fox, right? Like we are 100% a independent digital media company that has zero connection to foxsports.com or anything else. Um, but I've only had really good bosses and really good relationships uh, with, uh, with people over the years. Um, I did ask you about, right, I asked you about the Fox, the, Right. They haven't said anything about the, um, I think that's all I got. I mean, like I have a, you know, a few more calls. So if anything comes up, I'll check back with you next week. All right. What's your time frame on writing the story? I think it'll come out next week. Okay. Uh, well, just send it to me, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to call you back and just make sure I have things right. And then if anything else comes up, I will, I'll ask you, but yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah, send me, I'll, I'll email Whitlock. Um, okay. I would like to talk to him, but um, actually, I just saw on Twitter that his uh, mom passed away. I think it's his stepmom, uh, but uh, but yeah, he's he's uh, he, tw he tweeted that out. I'm assuming you're saying yes. Um, so yeah, he's I think in Indianapolis or on on his way to Indianapolis right now. Yeah, I'll wait um, to email him. But no, I think that's uh, I think that's all I got for you. But yeah, no, I'll have to check back with you next week. Um, you know, just to check everything and make sure I have it all right. Okay, cool. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Clay. Yeah, good luck with the 10-month-old. I'll see you. Thanks. Yeah, bye.